for, for ancient history at the University of Heidelberg. He has received his PhD in 2014 at the University of Stuttgart on the mobility of imperial Greek scholars. His research focuses on cultural and social exchange, especially the cultural impact of Greco Roman society in the Eastern Mediterranean, as well as the influence of ancient geography, geography and topography on ancient society and daily life. He has authored 10 publications on very different topics. One of his research recent collaborations focuses on acoustic reconstructions of ancient public speeches. Since 2017, he is a member of the Arab German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities and also serves as a member of the Census Steering Committee. Thank you very much. Uh, as you have already seen, I'm a very big fan of big introductory uh, lines, so I just shorten it up and uh, just put the first line into it and the rest you can uh, follow right after. Um, to show you what uh, one of my current ideas is, let's put it uh, in a picture. And uh, I'm a big fan of Asterix, so let's go to Athens and uh, let's have a look at this. Uh, the goats are looking uh, at the uh, Parthenon of Athens and uh, there are remarks like, uh, it reminds me of Bodhigara. Uh, or no, there's the uh, ah, sorry, sorry, go back. Uh, so uh, now I'm confusing you. So no, there's a little square in Massilia. Or what? No dolmens? And this is what I want to analyze. So if you are visiting another place, you always compare it to things you know. You say this is like or this is different. By this means, you include or you distinguish oneself from the other. So you, you say, ah, we do this as well, or no, we don't. And uh, you can analyze uh, these patterns in ancient texts as well, and look for how the gradients were received. So in ancient texts, in which cases is there, ah, that's just like the Arabians do it, or the Arabians do it just like others, or the third option is, no, they don't do it. They are absolutely different from uh, any other uh, country or anything like this. To the Greek sources, and uh, the last slide to the Greek word, uh, let's, look, uh, let's have a look at what uh, sources I have taken into account. There are many, many more which I could take into account, but these were only uh, first drafts of uh, a project I would like to uh, research way deeper in near future, uh, or way more. Uh, the first one is Herodotus, which is my main source for today. Herodotus uh, lived about 485 to 424 BC, so this is the most ancient I think we've got so far, so yeah. Uh, this is, uh, I always like when they are no serious because they are always older than me. So uh, this is the most ancient. Uh, it came from Halicarnassus, a uh, modern boardroom room uh, in the southwest of Asia Minor and writes the history of the Persian Wars. Uh, geography, since his uh, teacher has been Nicotias of uh, Milet, is of great importance to him. So he writes down geographic effects and wants to link them with each other. Uh, about uh, his own experience, he, is, uh, he has visited some places, although it's not quite sure, and in many cases highly debated which places he really did meet and, and which not. But uh, there are many sources or, or many archaeological finds which uh, <coughs> fit into him at Egypt. And uh, it is highly likely that he has visited Egypt and went up the Levantine coast and then back to Asia Minor. On his way, he hasn't <coughs> visited Arabia at all, so he's, he's uh, highly dependent on the hearsay. Uh, so, th this is uh, uh, his own contribution to it. The second thing you have to know is that uh, uh, he highly depends on his uh, teacher, Nicotinus 
on the division of uh, of the continents. So the modern division of continents is uh, this age. To say this is uh, Libya or Africa and this is Asia uh, is highly based on Herodotus. And uh, what is highly debated in this time is his teacher said that the Nile is a boundary. And he says, no, there, there's no sense in that to divide between the right part of the Nile and the left part. This, is, this all belongs to uh, Libya or uh, modern definition would be Africa. But uh, we will have a look at this later on. Then we have Diodorus, who is from Sicily, highly depends on uh, Agathachides of Hidos. We will have a short look on the Strabo of Amasia. Uh, it's in the northeastern part of uh, Turkey. And she's a geographer and historian, has written a book on Arabia, but highly depends on Aristotle's so third century BC. But don't worry, I will explain it when it's necessary. And the last, uh, the last source, which is from, there's only one certain manuscript from the Universitätsbibliothek uh, University of Heidelberg, so I have to stress this, this is uh, a home field. Uh, uh, and uh, it's from the middle of the first century AD. The author is uh, an Egyptian Greek, Greek, and he's a virgin. And we will have a look at these uh, four different uh, sources and have a look at how the uh, Arabians were received in this, these texts. So, to our first division, let's get to Egypt. And Egypt, as I already told you, there's this division in Europe, Asia, and Latin Libya. And uh, one of its main focal points is this division between Libya and Asia. So, may, most of his texts are about Egypt has nothing to do nothing at all with Arabia. The Arabians are completely different than the Egyptians. Please note, there's nothing, I will not analyze if it is true or not, I will merely analyze what they say and how they use it in a political sense. And uh, so what you can find is mainly a focus on the boundaries. The soil of Egypt is not comparable, comparable to Syria, Arabia, or the rest of Libya. Completely different. Egypt is a land around the Nile, no uh, Libyan or Arabic possessions. This is highly debated in this times because uh, uh, Hecataios has said uh, the right part of the Nile is Arabic. He says no, it's not. So. And the next is uh, he talks about garrisons. Uh, and uh, here it says uh, one of the most important is the Arabic or the Egypt garrison to Arabia, which is in Daphne Pelusium, so a division point. And he says he, this is still uh, in use since his time. So there is only a focus on division. We will not find any, uh, any comments on they are like. They are very much disliked. This is highly dependent on his thinking as Arabia in Asia. To put uh, Arabia into Asia, he has to um, uh, mark a division. But in later times, I wanted to show you that there has been some um, comparison. In later times, in the times of uh, Sparabo, you can see that there is a comment like this. All these Arabian cities are ruled by monarchs and are prosperous, being beautifully adorned with both temples and royal palaces. And their homes are like those of the Egyptians in respect to the manner in which the timbers are joined together. So this is a similarity. And uh, the author of this text is uh, not Strabo, but Eratosthenes. And Eratosthenes is living in Egypt. And he says the Arabians here are building houses just like us. And he stresses they have temples and royal palaces. This is a, this is a thing uh, Eratosthenes can deal with because, and here you can see the reason why, 
This is the world looking like in the time of Eratosthenes. Now you have a, an Egyptian boundary which goes up to southern Syria and you have a clear point of contact. And here you can say they are not others. They are in many fields just like us. There is trade, there is a, a cultural connection, so now you can say, okay, they are just like us. But uh, for Herodotus, they are completely different. Now, let's have a look at Syria, as Syria. Uh, I have looked at one field, it's religion. But they, the Persians, called the whole circle of heavens Zeus, and uh, to him they offer sacrifice on the highest peaks of the mountains. They sacrifice also to the sun and moon and earth and fire and water. Winds, they are the only gods to whom they have ever sacrificed from the beginning. They have learned later to sacrifice to the heavenly, heavenly Aphrodite from the Assyrians and Arabians. She is called by the Assyrians Milita, by the Arabians Alilat, and by the Persians Mitra. Here you can say there's a boundary, there's a connection between them in the fields of religion. And this is the only mentioning of, uh, um, or the only comparison um, uh, Herodotus makes on, uh, on Syrians and, uh, and Arabians. If we have a look at Persia, this is the same example I just, told, uh, I just showed you. And there's one second field. When a Babylonian has had intercourse with his wife, they both sit before a burnt offering of incense, and at dawn they wash themselves. They will touch no vessel before this is done. This is the custom also in Arabia. So again, there is a boundary. You can see there's a, uh, there's a clear division between Asia, where there are things common to each other, and uh, Libya, where things are different. And uh, this might be explained, at least in the words of Pliny, but he returns himself against to Herodotus, uh, to trade. So, Cultural habits and similarities are highly dependent on trade. So he says, but my own view is that they used to convey those commodities, uh, perfume trade, to the Persians even before they took them to Syria and Egypt. This being attested by Herodotus, who records that the Arabs used regularly to pay a yearly tribute of a thousand talents of incense to the kings of the Persians. So trade is... Uh, why they have uh, similar, similar uh, habits and customs. Let's have a look, a closer look, at Ethiopia. There's one comparison in uh, armory. The Arabians were mantles gilded up and carried at um, their right side long bows curving backwards. The Ethiopians were wrapped in skins of leopards and lions and carried bows made of palm wood strips, full, uh, full for full cubits long and short arrows therewith, pointed not with iron but with a sharpened stone, the stone, and etc. etc. So there's a clear division, they have the same arm, um, they have the same weapon, but a completely different aspect on uh, the clothing. The one are wrapped and the other are half naked. So this is the Libyan uh, Arabian <laughs> distinction here. So you can say in the world of Herodotus, this is the demarcation mark. You can say they are like this, or they, they at least are not like them. Maybe you put it this way, they are not like them, and uh, the other way, the way around. But uh, there is more into the perception of Arabia if you have a closer look at India. India, it says that uh, to India, he says, as I have lately said, India lies at the world's most distant eastern limit. And in India, all living creatures, four footed and flying, are by much bigger than those of other lands, except the horses. I don't know why, but which are smaller than the Indian horses called uh, the same. Uh, there is a story as well on uh, 
getting gold by riding into the holes of uh, ants with a camel. And uh, you have to get the gold and then ride away very fast because there are big ants in, uh, in India, in his perception. So you have to flee from these wild ants. This is the world uh, Herodotus presents to us. This is the other world. And uh, this is the eastern border, but there are some similarities. Again, Arabia is the most distance to the south of all inhabited countries. And this is the only country with, which uh, yields frankincense uh, and myrrh and cassia and cinnamon and gum message. All these but myrrh are difficult for the Arabians to get. So then he tells us of adventures, which animals to fight to get cinnamon, and uh, so you don't get it for free, you always have to pay your price. And uh, you have clear similarities regarding the other words between India and Arabia, because it's an unknown world. And in an unknown world, you can always say, yeah, that things are going wild. Where they are completely different from us. And uh, this, uh, m most of the time, tells us that it's uh, absolutely unknown what, what is going on in Arabia at these times. Now we have a last closer look at Arabia and the presentation of Arabia in these times. So first to the flora and uh, the natural resources. I said enough of the spices of Arabia Airs wondrous sweet blow from that land. So this is a magical land for, for Herodotus, where everything you want to get, you can get. You have uh, very good natural resources like gold and gems and copper. Uh, you can get everything you want, while at the same time you can have uh, uh, milk and uh, many other resources. But at the same time, it always comes with a cost, as I already, uh, already told you. Have a look at the fauna. So there are, they had moreover two marvelous kinds of sheep. I, uh, I think you never thought about uh, dangerous forms of sheep. So if you want to get to know which one are the dangerous one, and they are big sheep and frightening and etc. So even the, the sheep are dangerous in Arabia. So you have to. Be careful of them. Then you have uh, um, a wild beasts like the ostrich, which is presented in here, as a trudukameli. He's a camel-like type. So if you ever thought about what an ostrich is like, for Herodotus, it's all compared to camels. Uh, and uh, this is the same with the camelopard. Camelopard. It's a it's a uh, giraffe, which is uh, described, but he all, uh, also compares it to uh, camels. Then you have the phoenix, which only comes living in uh, Arabia and only comes uh, one every once every 500 years to Egypt. But uh, except for this, he's living. The phoenix is living in Arabia. You have flying snakes. And they, fly, uh, and they fight with the leaders. So this is another distinction line. There's a description of flying snakes, uh, which uh, gather and then fly through uh, over the Red Sea and attack Egypt. And uh, therefore, you have the leaders who fight back. Uh, so in, uh, his uh, in his description, it is highly likely that the, these uh, flying snakes are grasshoppers. So they yeah, are becoming less uh, dangerous when you, uh, or, or dangerous in another way when you have a look at this. Then, the last uh, view on the camels itself. Because in the description of Herodotus, camels high, are highly, um, or are mainly focused on Asia. There's no description on any camels in Egypt, because that could be a likelihood. So, he has to stress, the only ones in the army of the Persians riding with camels are the Arabians. And they have to ride last because the horses are afraid of them. So, yeah, you have to go. I, I, forgot, I took a picture in Cairo of a, a 
uh, a horse and a camel is standing next to each other to symbolize harmony. So please imagine this horse uh, camel picture uh, right next to it at the bottom. And uh, this is the last example, uh, or the second, the last example I want to show you. This is on um, this is on piracy, <laughs> and uh, this is from the Perry Cruz. And here it says there's a distinction between the Arabians. Uh, living next to the sea and the Arabians living in the hinterland because the raiders and the pirates are the uh, Arabs in the hinterland and uh, those living at the sea they are comparatively uh, friendly and you always have to watch the Arabian side of the Red Sea because it's dangerous and you can't ride through it uh, this may be, uh, there may be a reason to it because before the uh, before Egypt got direct contact to India in the 3rd century BC, everything went through Arabia. So the ports at Arabia were highly frequented, and right at the time when this kind of trade going over Arabia stops and the direct trade, we have the first reports, uh, first reports on raids and piracy. So this is uh, kind of an Revenge. But what I want to stress is that up to uh, the Augustan age, very little was known of Arabia at all. It was a highly closed area, so it, it remained a uh, uh, terra, uh, terra incognita. incognita. Terra incognita. I wanted to uh, make a remark on the next uh, paper, uh, and uh, here you can see you can hardly gather any information on Arabia at all. So to close uh, my considerations on Egypt and uh, uh, the, uh, Arabia, uh, on Arabia, let's go back to Egypt for one last thank you for your attention. And this is uh, the last picture, also on Asterix and. Uh, Obelix doesn't like the pyramids at all, so he, he says, uh, I would always uh, uh, give me a many uh, any day, so he, yeah, he doesn't like them, but uh, so thank you for your questions. Christian, a lot of thanks for this presentation and bringing us into uh, antique icon. Antique, antique uh, literature. A lot of what you were saying depends on the term Arabia yeah. and Arabs. So the first question, naturally, I guess, how to define Arabia? How did uh, Herodotus define Arabia or the Arabians? Mm -hmm. We know there's a language issue in our usage of Arabians, i.e. those who speak the Arabic language, but this didn't come up in your example, so, mm -hmm. so is there a definition for that period, for that word of Arabia or the Arabians? No, because he doesn't know them at all, so he merely can say they are living around there. So one, one remark uh, which is of interest might be that they, uh, in the thinking of uh, the, the uh, classical up to Hellenistic times, they only had one king for instance, which is highly unlikely that they only had one king, but so they can get it. You, you have to make a treaty with the Persians, how to deal with it, there has to be a king who deals with everything. So you have no no uh, real perception of this period at all, you only have uh, contact with them uh, thanks to merchants and, uh, and uh, warfare sometimes. But Except for this, there's no deeper context in any but, but then the question arises from where did he get his terminology? So mm -hmm. why are they Arab and Arabians and not whatever, what tribal name or... Yeah. They are living here. Therefore they are Arabians. This is his uh, description. So no further distinction or anything like this. These are the people living here. But you're implying now that yeah. the Arabian Peninsula is a geographical background knowledge of this? Yeah, this is correct. Uh, the, the, this is uh, not so much uh, correct for Herodotus times, but uh, afterwards you have quite some knowledge, thanks to Alexander the Great, that there's a Persian Gulf. Uh, 
And uh, then you have the, uh, the remarks that uh, the, the land between the Persian and the Gulf and the Red Sea has to be Arabia. So no one could really uh, conquer Arabia, which is partly dependent on the little knowledge, uh, knowledge of the landscape itself. So they didn't know how to deal with it. How, uh, one example is that uh, these Arabians in the northern parts are often uh, described as bandits and raiders, and they can always escape since they go through the desert and they are the only ones who know where to find water. So, and th this is uh, the division line uh, shown to us. So there is some knowledge, but uh, there are many stereotypes at the, at the same time. At the same time, I wouldn't stress that they, uh, after intercourse with the women, sit before a fire and uh, wash themselves or something like this, but this is the world they imagined. So I'm highly dividing it. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question? Yes. Yes, please. It's a very small comment, uh, maybe a question. In regard to the religion of uh, the, the, the Syrians and Iranians, <laughs> And the particular word that uh, you have quoted uh, from Harry Potts, that is Mitra. Mm -hmm. Well, this actually opens to us a vista of interaction between Persia and India on yeah. the religious lines. Because Mitra happens to be uh, an Indian god yeah. that has been uh, uh, described in the Vedas. Yeah. And, exactly. and this is significant in, this, in, in that context that uh, during the, uh, um, the, the period of uh, Gupta, yeah. the Gupta, Gupta period, uh, Bala or Bactria happened to be part of the Indian continent at the time. And uh, the religion at that time was Hinduism. And that's why some of the scholars have interpreted Zenda Avesta as a, a modified version of Atharva Veda. Yeah. In Atharva Veda, this god Mitra has been mentioned. It's absolutely clear that there were uh, strong contacts between India and Arabia. This is why it's so sensible to say that the raids uh, around the Red Sea begin at the point where the Egyptians are not buying from the Arabians directly anymore, but have their own way to come to India directly. So this is a point where the locals say they are not buying from us, that let's, uh, let's uh, rob everything they've got and uh, bring it back to us. And then, then trade again on other terms. But uh, it, it is absolutely clear that uh, there were high contacts, but again, it is not on uh, how it really was, but how it was imagined. And here they say this is, this is how Herodotus imagined the world to be. <clears throat> you are absolutely uh, right. Uh, in fact, we can say by archaeological findings that there were high contacts, and they managed to deal with it very early. Way earlier than the Greeks, who at first uh, they didn't know how to deal with the monsoon. Okay, thank you very much. We we have to leave uh, other uh, questions to the break time. Please over. Thank you very much. Uh, our, uh, uh, our next speaker is Konstantin Klein. He will talk to us about. Terra Cloverta, the land of Arabia and its inhabitants in late Roman imagination. Constantine uh, uh, studied ancient and medieval history, Oriental studies, German and Italian in Bangor, Germany, and Oxford, UK, where he finished his PhD in the classics in 2016. After a fellowship at Harvard in the USA, he worked as a lecture, uh, lecturer and the, chair, uh, and the chair of the ancient history in Bamberg, Germany since 2011. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, many thanks to the organizers, um, to uh, Noha, uh, Beate and Christian uh, for having me here. Um, and also again many thanks to Christian because your very last words uh, about uh, the imagination is the ideal way to slide over to my presentation because this is all about late Roman imagination. And uh, this morning I um, tried to shorten my presentation by just cutting out one topic I told even before. But I think it is just worth mentioning in terms of this terminology that in the fourth century, I'm not going to talk about it, but in the fourth century we have two authors who at the same time try to find a new um, 
tone to describe the raiding desert Arabs. So this is uh, both Sarazeni and Ishmaili, uh, so from Ishmael and the other one from South, and no one knows where the word comes from. Um, but this is like in the fourth century AD that we have a word that, so they are not Arabs anymore because the word Arab is used for other people. Yeah. Um, but I'm not talking about that um, here. Um, let's start with literature. In uh, Elias Khoury's novel, uh, Kaana Naima, as if she was sleeping, the story's protagonist, Melia, is described as a fantastic cook. Her husband, Mansour, enjoys her food and his favorite dish is called veal in its mother's milk. Um, and um, we, I think we had something very similar today at lunch, so I uh, integrated a new slide um, here. Um, so, so um, Mansour enjoys this dish very much. Um, at one point, remarks that it is strange that the old Arab poets um, have written about so many sweets, but not about savory dishes such as real in its mother's milk. That's not a real dish, uh, that's not a real name, Melia tells her husband. They call it that in Beirut, but uh, it's a dish from Damascus. In Damascus, they call it shakiriya. Mansour is unimpressed, however, he remarks that the dish's name is a challenge. It has been said that uh, thou shalt not see a calf in its mother's milk. Um, that's already in the Old Testament. Media is convinced and wants to stop cooking the dish because this is, I quote, barbaric. Mansour, so some of us ate barbaric food this um, lunchtime. Um, Mansour announces that the dish is so delicious that he does not care, just like me, um, and that they will go on eating veal in his mother's milk until all eternity. For Elias Khoury's narrative, this is only one unresolved conflict in a troubled marriage between Melia and Mansour. However, as a late antique historian, I was surprised by this passage, which I just summarized for you. The idea that cooking meat in milk is something barbaric is a very old idea, uh, and we encounter it very often in late antique texts about the lands of Arabia and the Near East in general. When talking about the knowledge that Greek and Roman authors had about the region in late antiquity, we face a rather complicated problem with the sources. I have argued elsewhere that it does not make sense to put together the entirety of all sources on Arabia in late antiquity in order to gain a coherent picture. When doing so, we would obtain an even mosaic of little mosaic stones that could not be pieced together for the simple reason that these instances derive from a multitude of authors with their own source traditions as well as their own agenda and bias, as the following remarks hopefully aim to demonstrate. What therefore seems a more promising area for research, and it was what Christian just showed us, um, is um, not um, to look at uh, what is described in late antique material on, um, on Arabs, but how it is described. This paper does not aim to evaluate the historicity of single episodes, but rather to identify common literary motives by contextualizing the accounts and ask why particular authors made use of particular imagery. I will focus on three motives, uh, um, on food, um, on customs, and on location. You will see that Amelia's dish, wheel in its mother's milk, will play an important part, an important part in it. So first, uh, barbarian diets. Some passages in the so-called Narrationes, a 5th century account attributed to one Nilus of Ankara, read like the stuff that nightmares are made of. The text, which, uh, the text, which is uh, blood-curling and sophisticated alike, reports the fate of Nilus and his son Theodoros, who is abducted during a raid by nomadic Arabs on Mount Sinai. The author describes at length the truly barbaric lifestyle of the Saracen abductors. The aforesaid nation of Arabs inhabits the desert extending from Arabia to Egypt's Red Sea and River Jordan. So it's Arabia uh, Deserta here. They practice no craft, trade, or agriculture at all, but use the dagger alone as their means of subsistence. They live by hunting desert animals and devouring their flesh, or else get what they need by robbing people on roads that they watch in ambush. If neither is possible and their provisions run out, they consume pack animals. They use camels, called dromedaries, for food. Theirs is a bestial and bloodthirsty way of life. Killing one camel per clan, they soften its flesh with heat from a fire only till it eats to their teeth without having to be too forcefully thrown. 
Since the beginning of Greek historical writing, our nutrition habits have always been a good starting point for ethnographical digressions. In Herodotus' description, the nomadic Scythians are eaters of raw meat and drinkers of milk, that is, curdled milk or yogurt. This Scythian diet proved formative for later accounts. It would soon become indispensable and stereotypical for any future Greek or Roman description of barbarian food, and it is the ingredients of the dish that Melia in Elias Kubis' novel recognizes as barbaric as well. In antiquity, the raw meat, of course, provided the reader with a link to the barbarian's brutish and animal like habits. Herodotus's tell me what you eat and I will tell you what you are approach is a literary motive with a long afterlife. Strange foods continued to be the universal element, for example, in ethnographical descriptions of nomads by authors from sedentary societies. In addition, it is not only what one eats that defines a person, but also how one eats. This seems to be true for an Nihilist narrator in the Narrationes as well, who concludes that his description, um, and of you, who concludes his description with the phrase, in a word, they eat like dogs. But he goes one step further. The protagonist, Nilus, learns from a messenger's report that the Arabs would, uh, who abducted his son are eager to sacrifice the boy and consume his flesh. As these narrationes um, should be first and foremost seen as fiction, and their author as a talented writer who knew how to create suspense and excitement, it's really good to read, but you shouldn't read it before you go to bed, because then you might have nightmares. Um, so it, it would be pointless to investigate whether some pre-Islamic Arabs did indeed practice occasional cannibalism. This may well, however, be seen as a testimony to the occurrence of human sacrifice, a practice recorded in some other late antique sources. The cases we have at our disposal suggest a custom situated somewhere between extreme demonstrations of authority, as in the case of the Mahmid ruler Al Mundi III, who allegedly butchered 400 Christian nuns in honor of the deity Al Osa, who is the heavenly Aphrodite we've just seen before, um, and a cultural stereotype born, in, uh, born out of Christian fear and polemic, which was replete with ancient descriptions of barbarians. Once more, the link goes back to Herodotus, who also mentions as the most degraded human type the man eaters, the Anthophagoi. They have the most savage customs of all men, he writes, and compares them to animals, not practicing any form of justice or using any laws. Herodotus offered a simple but highly interesting explanation. The man eaters do so, for they are nomads. Herodotus' projection of subhuman manners habits and traditions on the distant peoples was applied by Roman writers to enemies much closer to Rome at times, even to fellow Roman citizens. Um, while they likened entire enemy nations to animals, accusations of cannibalism and human sacrifice appear equally frequently. The absence within nomadic societies of fixed settlements, laws, or government, according at least to the Roman perception, furthered the impression of these people's brutish character. Even though the archaeological <coughs> evidence in the Near East does not point to a substantial threat from Arab nomads in late antiquity, personal perception was quite another matter. Um, I think I have, no, I don't have the slide here, we shall see. Um, some exceptions can be misleading. In his apologetic word, the cure of the pagan maladies, so, uh, the cure of the um, non Christian maladies, we should rather say, uh, Theodoret of Cyrus in the, fourth, the fifth century argues that his readers should seek out barbarians and learn their languages in order to Christianize those areas that were still pagan. On the Arab tribes, he remarks, as to our neighbors, the nomads, they are endowed with an intelligence lively and penetrating, and they have a judgment capable of discerning truth and refuting falsehood. Apparently, Theodore's Arabs have all the necessary prerequisites to be law-abiding, but as no one had so far presented them with rules for morality, they had not yet been able to reach that stage. Like the Germans in Tacitus' famous account, Theodorus Arabs uh, served as an atavistic contrast to the author's own society, even with a sort of twist in favor of the nobles. The development of mankind comes with a loss of happiness. The concept of the noble savage derives from this context. In our case, the Arabs are not yet depraved by the corrupting effort of civilization. They can serve as an antitype to their own morally degenerated culture of the author. 
This binary of low lawlessness can already be found in the writings of Herodotus as well, who described the Androphagoi as lawless and man-eating barbarians. However, he also mentioned barbarian isodones. You have, might have seen them on Christian's map. They were in the far uh, top right corner. Um, the isodones who feast on human flesh mixed with morsels of wild sheep meat. Interestingly, these people are classified as slow abiding. While the Androphagoi are presented as the most degraded human type, the Isidons of servants of law seemingly removes the blemish of their cannibalism. So you can be a cannibal, but you have to abide to law, it's fine. Um, the Eduet shows in a different world, the Historia Religiosa, how the Arab nomads came into contact with law and civilization. Among the many charismatic ascetics described within this account, Simeon the Stylite, um, Simeon the guy who is on the column, um, excels in his function as a lawgiver to the Arabs. Christian law in antiquity, however, is not only treated as equal with Christianity per se, but implies more. The formerly barbarian nomads forgo their vices and make a significant change in their dietary customs. As you can see here, they stop eating um, wild ass and camels. Um, so by becoming Christians, they, uh, they, they change their diet. As if to contradict his previous arguments and to remind the reader that some of the Arabs' previous savagery survived in their character, the Edward goes on to describe their goals, arguments, and fights, thereby emphasizing Simeon's achievements in converting these savage people. When the holy man refers to them, uh, them to the Edward for further lessons in spiritual education, the Arabs gather around him so tightly that they nearly suffocate the bishop. While this could be interpreted as indicating their enthusiasm for the new faith, it may also show contempt for their still barbarian habits. Case study number three, a need for separation. The fourth century scholar Jerome authored several texts in which nomadic Arabs play a key role. His Vita Malki resembles a classical romance and should, as a text, be mainly considered as fiction designated for a Roman audience. In this text, the protagonist is abducted by Saracens, so that's Jones, the first one who uses this word, um, by, by Arabs, who live in a truly degenerate world. Women hold power, nakedness prevails, a trait that's probably Caesar, the Roman notice in the Germans, and eating habits are disgusting to the Roman taste, as the Arab raiders compelled Marcus to drink camel's milk and eat half raw meat. The values of these people are inverted. We find Jerome's models again in classical literature, for example, in Apollonius' account of the so-called Mosinesians, who do everything a civilized man would do in secret, most notably sexual intercourse, out in the open, whereas everything that should be public, for example, the people's assembly doing politics, takes place in private. It is interesting to note that in most depictions of such societies, ancient authors from Herodotus to Jerome and beyond mention a clear demarcation line. Herodotus' Scythia is divided by a river which separates the world of the nomads and the sedentaries. Similarly, in Herodotus' description of North Africa, it is a lake that marks the boundaries. Thus, from Egypt to the Tritonian Lake, the Libyans are nomads that eat meat and drink milk. On the other side, they eat proper things. The Augustian, uh, Augustian uh, geographer Strabo calls the desert of Chalkis, the region in which the Arab nomads roamed, Parapotamia, Riverside. Again, a river is etymologically um, the boundary between sedentary life and the nomads, so I wanted to show that earlier, but we can uh, leave that quite now. Um, all the country to the south of the Armenians belong for the most part to the tent dwellers. These tent dwellers are similar to the nomads in Mesopotamia. And it is already the case that the people are more civilized in proportion to their proximity to the, Scythi to the Syrians, so, and that the Arabians and Tentrellas are less so, the former having governments that are better organized. Even in Jerome's late 4th century text, uh, there seems to have been a need for such divisions. The first instance is not a river, but the road that the protagonist Malthus is traveling. It has, this road has the civilized world on one side and the hostile Arab world on the other side. Then, after his abduction, Jerome's protagonist encounters this inverted world on the other bank of the river, probably the Euphrates of Kabur, uh, that they had crossed, as if the literary genre requests that strange things only happen on the other side of the river. 
This description of the Euphrates as a mental border fits well with the research carried out by the German Archaeological Institute on the eastern frontier, Qatar, in Arabia, um, which clearly establishes the demarcation line as a dynamic and permeable zone of contact rather than merely a static, uh, static defense system and a military barrier against the tribes. Even within the 6th century, Procopius noted that uh, the Arabs are naturally incapable of storming a wall or the weakest kind of barricade put together with perhaps nothing but mud. The collective fears expressed in various texts suggest little sympathy with the Normans. Small scale raids certainly were a real existing problem for the late Roman population living in Syria or Palestine. However, by stating that these alien nations lived behind natural barriers and borders, the writers reassured their readership that a potential danger was far away and represented an anonymous threat. This was intensified by the fact that, as a rule, the texts do not provide further information on the whereabouts of the Saracens, although historical sources at the same time increasingly refer to the areas associated, uh, associated with nomadic Arabs and sometimes even give considerations of their proper names, for which we can sometimes gain information on tribal identities. However, Jerome's literary strategy of presenting anonymous enemies living in a strange, faraway world that resembles a fantasy land and occasionally making attacks upon the unfortunate people who happen to live in or journey through dangerous regions would hardly have proved satisfying if it had not combined the legendary depiction with a second important narrative. Thanks to God's protection and intervention, Jerome's hero, Malchus, manages to escape this uh, Arab's captors and arrive safely in the civilized Roman territory. To conclude, the inhabitants of Arabia in late antiquity offered Greco-Roman uh, authors the possibility to elaborate on a, power, on a variety of topoi, be it their divine lifestyle, which could, be, um, which could both reassure the readers and excite their curiosity, their construction as noble savages in contrast to the writer's own society, and the demonstration of God's omnipotence in that Christians could eventually convert these people, or when conversion was not possible, could still hope for very potent miracles. The corpus does not all, uh, thus also contain valuable ethnographical information on certain aspects of the Arab's daily lives, but one has to be very careful to discern which elements have their roots in much older descriptions and are therefore kind of myths. If we look at the text survey in this paper, it seems that the value of the late antique sources on, nom uh, on nomadic Arabs is rather low, which is also I think, your conclusion. While miracles, divine intervention, and conversion naturally play important roles in Christian texts from late antiquity, um, um, historiography appears to be just as little concerned with the production of an accurate account as the various saints' life would have. Most of the authors I've surveyed left to posterity the impression that the inhabitants of the late antique Roman Empire lived in a constant fear of a barbaric world engulfing the individual, the town, the city, or the whole empire. The at times imagined threat of sudden Arab raids never disappeared, not even the fortifications along the border with their high and conspicuous towers seem to have been sufficient to stifle these fears. Just as valid ethnographical information from those texts describing late antique Arab nomads must be distinguished from topical descriptions, it is also vital to observe the difference between objective circumstances and the subject, uh, subjective perception of the same circumstances described in texts that reflect notions of insecurity and fear. Both aspects are important to historical research and should not be brought into opposition. It appears sensible to keep these aspects in mind when working on late antique description of Arabia and of Arabic nomads. All the accounts discussed here clearly have unique aspects that might help to shed light on our knowledge of pre-Islamic Arabs, yet they all drew their motives from the same pool of classical sources. Thank you very much. Yes, questions? Thank you very much for this very nice uh, presentation. Uh, one question uh, which uh, raised in my, uh, on my page, on my topic as well, was the drinking habits. Do we have uh, anything on drinking habits? Uh, because uh, in, uh, in Herodotus, I think there's a mentioning of uh, the, the special way of milking and uh, drinking the milk. This might fit to you as well. 
There's no example coming to my mind. In Amianus Marcellinus, it states that they don't drink alcohol. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the, the milk they always use in sources, I mean, it is not milk as we would buy in the supermarket today, but it is like blotted, like the milk that you can transport yeah. for long periods. But uh, I don't know anything about country. Yeah. Milk in the camels or the, the horses. But, but, but it shows uh, because when you look at uh, descriptions of Germans, it's not just the raw meat, it's also the drinking habits. They are drunk, they don't mix the wine, they drink it, unmixed, they only drink wine and don't put water in it. How barbaric this is. So, you, you may ask yourself, so how barbaric this is to, to do it unmixed, and this is why. It, uh, but it shows. Quite well, and you have uh, proven quite well as well, um, uh, as such that uh, Greeks and Romans couldn't deal with just eating meat or just eating anything that comes up out of an animals without grain. What is life worth for? So this is the basic idea. And uh, as for the mixing, also the like when they convert to Christianity, we have this accounts like five to ten of them. Um, the change of diet always is from raw meat and milk to bread and wine. Yes. So you have, first of all, you have the grain, but then naturally, bread and wine is also yes. quite a Christian diet, I would say. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, um, well, thank you. Um, as you call it a fiction, I must ask you this question coming from the graduate school that is looking at science and fiction in the But if you look at it, uh, by a quite perspective, you have to take into account that science and fiction and fictional literature might have meant something entirely different in your temporal context. How do the readers realize that they're dealing with the work of fiction and not with some, something that has a factual play? I mean, are there markers? Do you have the label of novel or whatever? And I mean, fictionality might have meant something entirely different in your. Yeah, that's perfectly true, and I mean, there is a. Um... I'm part of a working group which is called um, uh, Hagiography as Literature. Um, because so hagiography is a term for saints' lives. And um, of course, saints' lives are real if you believe in it. And it's real for most parts of the audiences. Um, the case of Jerome is very interesting because in one of his saints' lives, um, there is a cantor and there is a little fawn, which is like, like a like half goat, half uh, human. Um, who is uh, walking around, and I think also a griffin. Um, so animals that the readers would, I would now say, certainly know that they don't exist. Uh, so I think this marks it as... It's a picture of elements. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Christina, for very informative uh, papers. Um, uh, just a little comment, and also a question. A little comment is the move from meat to bread. Um, in Aramaic, lahma, of course, means bread, and in Arabic, it, it, it tends to mean meat. And the, I think there is some connection. In fact, that it basically means a staple. Um, and the question is um, really about language. Now, you mentioned the fact that uh, um, there was a conversion process, and that Simon of Sila, the Sila, uh, we have a text in Syria, an anonymous light book of Simon of Sinai. And there we have communication between him and the Arabs, or the Arabs that come to visit him now. Is there any sense of what language they use to communicate with each other in this? And of course, when one converts, one is converting from, uh, I mean, one is converting based on an understanding of what one is converting to. And then, of course, you have the whole liturgical question of what sort of liturgical uh, language were they using at this point. Uh, so really the question is, uh, was there any understanding in these texts, in these late antique texts, and also in the ancient texts, of the language that the Arabs used, and uh, uh, what was their understanding about that? Any answer is a minefield, um, in terms of when, what, what those people called Arabs by the Romans, let's say, um, talked. I would now say that 95% it would be Syriac. We have one example, but again, it is Jerome, and uh, he quotes that they say Barek, which is not Arabic, I would 
lot of put that in, in Syria. But then again, it is Jerome who in, in the same text has this um, this control. So um, yeah, um, I, I think in, in the case of uh, Syrians, uh, the Stalinite, it, it would be Syria. But that's more I guess because that's the region, the region, and I mean we kind of know about the pool of the converts that he is. Um, is, is attracting and uh, the Soviet life that you mentioned it gives a couple of converts by name. One is uh, Lohan, um, who is a Hassanid ruler. Um, so we have to deal with the question what language did the, the Japanese so, uh, Hassanid picture, which I think is a Christian Palestinian Hassanid picture. So, in a way, the, the Hassanids, which are all Christian Palestinians nowadays, are the good guys. So, it's problematic that these very good volumes have like a political bias, so one has to be more careful. I think that's also what I was aiming at in my concluding remarks. Second bit with um, Allah, so Alilat, I would say it's not Allah, but it goes to Allah, one the uh, minor <laughs> female <laughs> daughters, yeah. Um, and this again is um, one of these deities that have been identified with um, the heavenly Aphrodite. Who has like the companion um, the Lucifer, the morning star? But then, of course, there are other. We talked about it yesterday over, over lunch. Um, Ibn Khaldun says that it comes from the verb latter to moisten because there was a guy who was moistening porridge, which we had yesterday. And mm -hmm. because he was moistening porridge on that stone, after a while, the stone, or he was called Allah because he's the moisturizer, moisturizer, I don't know. Um, and then the date took its name. So. But Herodotus, for example, is the first yeah. time that this name is mentioned, so no study. I mean, this is PhD yeah. of Susanne Corner on, on the history of Allah. Um, it's the first instance that's strange and it's so early. On and, and there is no interest in the, de the details or the differences. It merely is of interest that this is Aphrodite, and then it's okay. And then you can call it Aphrodite, and if there are any, so the interpretatio greater. Uh, how we might call it. So the focus uh, for us is otherwise than the focus of the Greeks. That's the for, for them, it, it is of interest. I mean, that is Aphrodite, and then you can deal with Aphrodite. I guess modern historian, I also do not want to copy in the old Greeks' yeah. perspective. Yeah, I'm questioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you always have to be careful. Yeah. Thank you very, thank you very much. We will move on to our third speaker, Victor Martin Rodenstock, who will talk about Edward uh, um, uh, Hayes in the Arabian Gulf. Uh, 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 Martin is assistant professor of German at Gulf University for Science and Technology in Kuwait. He received his PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and has previously uh, held positions at uh, Iowa State University and the University of Connecticut. Well, thank you very much for those kind introductory words. My thanks also to the ARIA team and, of course, the AUS team for putting together this fantastic conference. I have learned a lot these past few days and also been well fed. And I learned calligraphy. Beat that. Um, I should probably say, by way of preface, that uh, this is a work in progress. As you will see, there are still some gaps in the story. And it will probably take me another research trip to England to fill them. However, I believe I have found enough thus far to sketch for me the portrait of man who came through the Gulf in the mid 18th century. So we're jumping um, a millennium or two. Uh, and to situate him in his age, to show how contemporary discourses intersect in his work, and also to suggest why his encounter with the Gulf, with the laws, is suggestive of things to come. <clears throat> this is the work in question, uh, Voyage from England to India, published in 1773. That's the first edition you see there on the left in the center, and it is today housed proudly in the Center for Research and Studies on Kuwait. I also put a pretty good, uh, copy of the book on the side, on the right side, just so you can get maybe half of the thing. It's a great 500 pages almost. 
And the man who wrote this book was Edward Ives, a surgeon in the British Navy, in which capacity he served in the Franco-British Wars in India between 1754 and 1757. The title of this book is somewhat misleading, The Voyage from England to India, which is the title by the Cape of the Hope of Madagascar, only takes up the first chapter of his narrative. Chapters 2 through 13 describe his years in India. These chapters are then followed by the second half of the volume, of counting of his return voyage to England by the Arabian Gulf. So he came to a huge, literally past charge, right? if we could travel back in time 260 years, we see an Indian now from Bombay going up the coast and then through Mesopotamia, Syria, Cyprus, Italy, Austria, some of the German states, and Holland, and then across the channel and back to England. In the early pages of the second half, Ives then chronicles the encounter which has secured him a place in the history books, and which is the reason why this book is today in, on display in its last case in the library of the Center for Research and Studies on Kuwait. So let me give you this quote. On Friday, the 14th of April, and we're in the year 1758, to our great satisfaction, the Luca, small boat, probably seen with a triangular sail, returned from Brain and brought the long expected Arab. He behaved very complacently, assuring us of his best assistance and how ready he was to accompany us to La Lapa. <coughs> He added that this day was the seventh of the moon, and by letters received from different places it appeared that the great caravan for Aleppo would be near grain on the 20th. The Sheikh seemed delighted with our determination and advised us to leave the Karek on the 15th that we might then get to grain in proper time, assuring us that he himself would return back to grain in a day or two to get the camels, etc., ready for our use. And you can see this is on page 222. So were already well detailed its narrative. Grain is a transliteration of al karim I'm mispronouncing this, but I was assured that it, at least in Kuwaiti Arabic, translates as small hill, and the ancient name of Kuwait. And these are the lines that mention it for the first time ever in Western literature. And the precise locale of al karim is probably not the Bay of Kuwait, where the city is located today, but rather in the south present day country near the uh, Saudi Kuwaiti border and the oasis of Afra. There has been some inconclusive speculation as to the identity of Isa's long expected Arab, though he is unnamed, of course, in Isa's narrative, but it is at least possible that the man in question was Sabah bin Jada, the first ruler of Kuwait and founder of the dynasty which rules the country to this day. And Ives references as the locale of the encounter with the Sheikh is the island of Kak, which I highlighted there with that red hunter, across from Kuwait near the Persian coast, where the Dutch had established a fort and trading house in 1753, which they then lost again 13 years later in 1766. What is apparent from Ives' words is that Kuwait at the time already served as a transportation hub. Here at the northern end of the Gulf, the caravans, sometimes 5,000 camels strong, assembled and rested before then commencing the voyage of three to four weeks across the desert to Aleppo, transporting goods from the Gulf from India and further east, before then making the return voyage with goods from the Levant and from Europe. The Sheikh Ayaz Meets tries his best to tell the group of European travelers on their way home the model of courtesy and hospitality, which is a standard trope of European travel literature on the Arab world at this time already, and a standard feature of writings in the coming centuries. Later on, though, the Sheikh will also drive a hard bargain, and the European will have to negotiate back and forth for a good price for the voyage. And this, too, is a standard trope of European travel literature, centered on the Arab world. So, Kuwait's entrance into Western literature, this is what we want to call it, is not framed in any particularly original manner, nor is Ives' portrayal of the encounter particularly nuanced, but he is the person who made this contribution, unlike, say, the half dozen other Western men, British, of course, mostly in his traveling party, or the dozens who were making similar voyages around this time when Britain secured its grasp on India and the 
developed as a famous strategically important corridor for Britain between Europe and India. What has been of interest to me, therefore, is to reconstruct the biography of Edward Ives and to establish a sense of the intellectual paradigms to which he perceived this world. Basically, I'd like to know who this man was and what kind of thinking had shaped his perceptions. So let me give you a quote, this time relating to his years in India. And it's not a particularly exciting quote, but that is kind of the point. <clears throat> Having already mentioned Kutunat as a favorite of the Indians, they chew the chunam or shell line as a little shrub that grows like a line. I shall here subjoin a brief description of the Arika tree which produces the nut. It is a fine, slender, upright tree, not above six inches thick. At the bottom, it flows upwards of 30 feet high and is jointed at about eight or nine inches distance, perhaps the last year's growth. It contains a large quantity of pith, the woody part being thin as though, uh, uh, thin but as tough as whalebone. The leaves grow in the same manner, and it goes on for another dozen lines, and that is just one of many examples. So the point I'm trying to make is that Ives perceives the world with the eyes of a naturalist. His books on detail to the point of being tedious. He's obsessed with what he names to things. He's a poster child of the Enlightenment age. Sometimes someone describes, typifies, quantifies, organizes, classifies the world around them, and speculates on connections and possible new studies. The latter, of course, often with regard to possible medical properties of plants or curative functions of meat and practices he observes. However, his desire for knowledge extends beyond the immediately practical and suggests a multi dimensional perception of the world. Scientific, yes, primarily scientific, I would argue also economic, cultural, historical, archaeological. In fact, the phrase I've used for the text of my talk, for the sake of curiosity, he uses in the context of a visit to the ruins of Babylon, where he appropriates some ancient bricks, for the sake of curiosity. And the meaning of the word curiosity here oscillates between the one we have preserved in a word like curiosity shop, an item that is of interest because of its rarity, and the primary meaning of words that have been is also what it had in Isaac's time, i.e., something someone desires, someone's desire for knowledge. One might also point out that curiosity is a key term in the writings of Isaac's contemporary Edmund Burke, who in fact published his philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful in 1757 just as Ives was launching his return voyage to England. Burke begins his book by stating, quote, the first and the simplest emotion which we discover in the human mind is curiosity. And quote, whether Ives ever read this sentence, I cannot say. He never mentions Burke in his book. I'm still hoping to lay my hands on some letters, which are apparently in some archive, and maybe that will be more enlightening. I suspect, however, that he did not read Burke, as he never mentions Burke's key term, the sublime, though he, Ives, that is, would have had ample opportunity to do so of the ragged coastlines of Oman, which he passes and which he does describe extensively, but never dropping that key term. Be that as it may, Ives would certainly have agreed with Burke's statement of curiosity and the instinctive element of the human mind. Curiosity was in the air at the time, you might say. I was as an exponent of what Felix Schreiber, although none other than Joseph Conrad, has termed geography militant, and quote, exemplified by a worldly quest for knowledge about the geography of the earth, marked by voyages, exploration by sea and land. In contrast to the previous period of geography fabulous, which I probably would say the presentation we heard last uh, yesterday on the medieval maps with the one two, and which was marked by a projection of imaginary conceptions onto the blank spaces of the world, and also the same from the following period of geography triumphant, the all of the blank spaces have disappeared, and the discipline of geography has become wholly absorbed into the power dynamics of empire. I, as one might say, was a 
militantly curious scientific observer. Empire is certainly on his mind, and in fact he is implicated in the building of empire, simply in India. But his curiosity is not committed solely to this project, but rather exists as a distinct feature of his character, a free floating, that is sometimes um, a feature with no conscious purpose. The argument could of course be made, and it has been made, that the innocence of the scientific catalogue obscures liberty or consciously the manifest projection of power inherent in such an appropriate gesture. In the case of Iowa, so what you should kept in mind that the military endeavor he is involved in is directed, first of all, against another European power, France, and that his scientific appropriation of the world is thus, one might say, twice removed from real-life appropriation, which did, however, follow, and which I would certainly have condoned, not celebrated. That is, in the context of his scientific interests, that would, of course, be interesting to know of Ives' educational biography. He seems to have had a classical education. His book is full of references to Pliny, Tacitus, Herodotus, Cicero, all of whom he seems to have read in the original. But this is the gaping hole in Ives' biography I have so far been unable to fill. He was born in Lymington on the south coast of England in 1713. There is a possibility that his people, his family, were not Church of England people. And um, the community in which he grew up was a center of Protestant descent. And so this might have made him an outsider during his adolescence. In his writings, though, all his religious ire is directed against the Catholics, inhabitants of Polish countries, particularly against the Portuguese, whose presence in Goa he regards with suspicion, and he takes the task for the Inquisition which is a popular obsession in Britain at the time, the effects of which you can see all the way to the late, 70, uh, late 18th century in the Gothic novel. In general, though, Ives does not uh, seem to have been more than conventionally observant and not particularly invested or interested in metaphysics. After his birth, there is a crucial gap in his biography of 23 years, and he then again enters the historical record and he signs up as a surgeon's second mate on the Navy warship Norfolk in 1736. And this is Ives' superannuation document, which he received when he was discharged from the Navy. And you can literally, to the day, chart his rise to the ranks. So what happened in those 23 years? Where did he go to university? Did he go to university? He could also have apprenticed as a surgeon even as a barber, and then educated himself. Given the wealth of classical references and also his awareness of certain contemporary discourses on that moment, I think both apprenticeship and autodidacticism are less likely. So my goal for next summer is to fill in those gaps in Ives' biography. And if anyone here has a good idea where to look, talk to me, please. From the moment he enters the Navy, I don't go over time. I'll try five minutes next week. Uh, he never drops out of sight. He rises through the ranks from surgeon second mate, first mate uh, on progressively larger ships, and when he's discharged because of illness in 1757, he's surgeon on the flagship of the British Admiral, who is an officer's rank. After his return home, he marries his four children, buys property, and kids to the village near Portsmouth, to which he moves and publishes his book, the one we've been talking about in 1773. It is a handsomely produced volume, a volume audience, and here are some of the illustrations, a lot of standard catalog stuff, but also archaeological or quasi-anthropological material, and certainly all designed to buttress the discourse of objectivity. The book is dedicated to the son of his commanding officer, so clearly Ives was making a bid for the accumulation of social capital. And it worked hard for me. When he dies in the winter of 1776, away from his hometown in Bath, he is a wealthy man, and the local Bath paper eulogizes him as a pillar of the community, someone whose whole exemplary acts didn't honor to the nature of human nature. I have already alluded to other discourses present in Ives' work, aside from the arguably dominant one of the proto modern empiricist scientific view of the world. There is, of course, a healthy dose of British patriotism, or unhealthy dose, depending on how you feel about this, a celebration of the free British spirit, 
There is also a discourse of usefulness, typical of an account of an imperial voyage. I have a few times expressed his hope that his text will be of advantage to future travelers. And there are some quite interesting passages on gender relations and foreign lands, and a quite woman subtext of self ironization And he makes repeated allusions to himself as the quote unquote most popular person in the party. But what I'd like to conclude with is a look at what one might view as the discursive competitor to empiricism, and that is sentiment. And following Nigel Lee's here, who is himself in the <coughs> Barbara's Spratter argument, that quote, the Enlightenment travelogue was superseded by a quote within a quote romantic quest, which leads ultimately back into the tangle itself. I'm sorry, I was not able to get a hold of Spratter's book in Kuwait, so I'm quoting her here by Elise. And there's, of course, more to pack in this quote than I can possibly do in this presentation. Ives does, in fact, drop the buzzword, for instance, when he writes, quote, the Persian coast afforded the most romantic prospect, and quote, he also mentions romantic, pretty, flinty rocks, and picturesque, and romantic prospects. Never anything sublime, though. And these are passing references. He beholds these prospects out of the corner of his eye, one might say, that there is also this aesthetically charged relationship to the world. The romanticization of the Gulf, the Arabian Desert, and in general of the lands I was passes through on his voyage from India to the Mediterranean was, of course, well underway by the time he was writing the first English language edition of the Arabian Nights had been published between 1706 and 1721, more than 50 years before I had spent paper. And this type of Orientalist discourse would become ever stronger in the 19th century, making itself felt in water socks novels, for instance or um, for the German-speaking part of the audience then in the mega best-selling writer of Germany in the 19th century, Karl May, who made a fortune out of romanticizing the Arabian Desert. In Ives' work, romanticist tropes are only visible intermittently, but they are there, and there is a degree of self-awareness attached to them. None of the soul-searching Stafford at least identified as characteristic of texts that are Come, that there is conscious self stylization. I just make the point of stating that both men and incidents were felt by me with the most exquisite sensibility, end quote. It's another key term of the time, with the clear intention of suggesting that the writer of this book is not only a man of science, but also one who appreciates the world in realms that extend to what we today call the effective. Wants to present himself as a well rounded gentleman, someone who understands the world and can organize it in a fashion that makes it accessible and useful for a metropolitan audience and future imperial travelers. He also wants to make sure to be perceived as someone with an aesthetic appreciation of the world, someone who not only sees and knows, but also who feels. Let me finally return to the Gulf then. As Ives prepares to leave and embark on his overland voyage to the Mediterranean coast, the commander of the Dutch port on Carp Island is incidentally a mercenary from Frisia in northern Germany by the name of Baron Knipphausen. He gives Ives a list of books he asks him to send back from Europe. These are two Enlightenment men, and Knipphausen is the small pair and the male dictionary, but also Cervantes and Sir Moltke Girard. In addition, Knipphausen asks for mechanical instruments, any new invented optical instruments. The Baron is also interested in a diving bell, which is a surprisingly old invention. Aristotle in the problems already describes the diving bell, but recently Edmund Halley of Comet fame had made some improvements uh, to the device so that one could now stay underwater for up to four hours and see the uh, certain ways to replenish the air in the diving bell. Ives never mentions whether after his return to England he sent the Baron his diving bell, nor for that matter the mechanical devices or the books. But for some reason I find oddly compelling the notion that in the middle of the 18th century, a small time German aristocrat in Dutch employ might have been sitting in a British-made diving bell in the waters of the northern Arabian Gulf. Knithausen would have been interested in studying marine life. He would also have been interested in pearlbacks with the intention of harvesting them. 
And the latter is, of course, indicative of the relationship to the Gulf that the West will develop over the coming century. I have sent Kenneth Powell's and work charged with being human, first of all, a man of curiosity, scientific minds interested in the natural world for its own sake. Secondly, they were romantics with the lower case R. Thirdly, they were men of empire. This discursive field, composed of the discourses of science, romance, and empire, is the one in which most future Western travelers, Kuwait and the Gulf in general, will locate themselves. Though the relative emphasis they will place on these discourses will vary significantly from one author to the other. that he focuses on such things because you can see in 18th century literature there is a high interest in ancient uh, literature as well. So yeah, you have a point of continuity uh, in the description of uh, how the dead are buried. And, uh, so, so you can describe it at length and uh, be sure that uh, these uh, descriptions are well received. Yes, of course, there is a, a bid for authenticity. He mm -hmm. cites all the right people, and of course, if you cite the lot of us, whether the lot of us was actually factually correct. Yeah. Yeah. The matter is inscribing himself into this very powerful tradition. And as I said, the book is um, as an odd blend because I think partly it's a vanity project. As a uh, literary proposition, it doesn't work because it's almost unreadable over long stretches. So it didn't sell. But that wasn't the point. The point was essentially to impress the right people, um, to accumulate social capital that we want. And by, of course, referencing all the authorities, and by targeting the scientific community of the time, you do impress the right people. But you lose the larger audience of travel rights, or tribal consumers of travel narratives, which was emerging at the time. So if you read these, um, there's quite a body of work of British travel writing at the time, some of which was commercially successful. I was as well, um, as far as I can ascertain, basically it held dead on the press. But he probably wouldn't even have money because he wrote it to uh, um, travel goods. Uh, does he give sources beyond his own eyes? Uh, I'll see what would he say or does he talk about uh, who told him what story he talked to the locals? He talks to locals around that lot, um, which is not very deep though, and the sources he cites are the classics. Um, but he does, of course, have guides to take him to these sites, and he does report on what they're telling him, but it's very thin. Really, his main focus is to reference the writers of antiquity, not contemporary writing on these sites, which was in that best. One more question. Okay, thank you very much.